Hello and welcome to the Global Dialogue. I'm Shireen Bhan and today we're in conversation with the President and CEO of Hilton, Chris Nasetta. Chris, many thanks for joining us here on the program and it's good to have you here in India post the pandemic. Yeah, Shireen, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. And yeah, it's very nice to be back in India. It's the first time back since 2019. Seems like a long time, but a lot of great things happening in India, a lot of great opportunities for us, a lot of fabulous things happening in the industry and uh, really happy to be sponsoring Hixa here at the Hilton in Bangalore. You know, I'll talk to you about India in just a second, but you talked about 2019 and how the world changed post the pandemic. And many wrote obituaries of the travel, hospitality and aviation industry saying that things will never go back to normal again. People are not going to travel, people are not going to fly. And yet here we are, 2022, literally every hotel chain, large hotel chain recording uh, stellar numbers, including yours. Yeah, I mean, it was. I sort of famously said in like March, April, May of 2020, when asked by reporters on you know blogs on all the you know international networks, how's the industry going to survive this? What do you think is going to happen? Isn't it true that nobody's going to travel like they did before? I said I don't believe that to be the case. I think that people have a strong desire to travel for all sorts of reasons. Right now they can't because they're worried about health concerns. But when we get to the other side of the pandemic, I think it'll look a lot more like it did than it does. Um, and to, to to many that was outlandish. I mean, to many you know people would raise their you know eyebrows, roll their eyes, uh, chuckle. But I think I've proven to be right. Not that I'm always right, but in this case, I, I have been right. I mean, we've seen broad recovery around the world. C certainly here in India, we've recovered beyond the levels that we saw prior to the pandemic. And that's true almost everywhere in the world um, because people really do want to travel. It turns out that humans need humans. They want to travel for leisure and to have fun. They need to travel to keep their businesses going and to build relationships. And, and just like we're doing here at HICSA, um, they need to congregate in, at meetings and events in order to build relationships and innovate and collaborate. And so the industry is, uh, you know, many, many uh, thought us dead during COVID, but we're certainly not. We're back and things are things are quite positive everywhere in the world. And I think the opportunities everywhere are great and particularly a good here um, not just now, but I think for many, many decades to come in India. Yes, the recovery has been pretty secular. Uh, but what does the outlook uh, for 2023 and beyond look like? Because we are dealing with global macroeconomic uncertainties. It's, an, uh, it's a challenging environment. Interest rates are moving up. Uh, perhaps the stimulus buffer that people enjoyed, uh, that is now going to be uh, sort of something that we need to question. What will that mean? And, and maybe you've seen the best in terms of pent-up demand and revenge travel or what have you. What will that mean then over the next 12 to 18 months? months in terms of travel trends? Yeah, I, I look at it as like we have headwinds and, and tailwinds. Um, the headwinds you talked about, we have a lot of geopolitical concerns, you know, around the world, uh, ge you know, macroeconomic issues with inflation in many parts of the world high. Um, and as a result, central banks around the world trying to curb inflation by slowing economies. That's generally not good for any business, uh, including travel and tourism. And so those are those are co clearly headwinds. Um, having said that, there's a bunch of tailwinds that are uh, big benefits to the business. You mentioned pent-up demand. We certainly are still releasing pent-up demand, particularly, I mean, a little bit in the leisure, but particularly business travel and, and meetings and events. There's a lot of that. You have new demand because things have happened over the, over the time of the pandemic that people realize that they need to catch up on things. You still have broader economic growth that, that is occurring in the midst of all this. Um, you have greater mobility in the world. So COVID you know, accelerated a trend that, that existed um, pr prior to COVID, which is people can sort of work from anywhere because they have their device with them and they have you know, ways to get around the world, infrastructure, low cost airlines and the like. So greater mobility, different sort of workforce trends in terms of people's, you know, time in office versus more flexible time and you put all of all of those things together and I think those tailwinds mm -hmm. at the moment are much stronger than the headwinds which is why you see demand continuing to be quite strong at the same time in most parts of the world and certainly here in India you've had very little capacity added so 
not to oversimplify it, but the laws of economics are pretty powerful. You have demand growing for all the reasons that I talked about. You have supply that has been quite low because of a whole bunch of factors, but pandemic uh, being, you know, being the most significant of those. And while, yes, there are some headwinds, all of those tailwinds in terms of the broader fundamentals in the business are strong. So I expect at 2023 is going to be a pretty good year. I expect 2023 is going to be better than last year. Okay. I think it's going to be meet, around the world will be meaningfully better than 2019, the prior high water mark. And I do think over the next, you said 12 to 18 months, I think over the next 12 to 24 months, we are going to see in some parts of the world some macro uh, conditions that are slowing. But again, against a world where broader demand trends are, are quite good. Okay, so demand still holding. And the only reason I said 12 to 18 months is because, who you know, knows? who knows? Yes, who knows? That's really, I agree. That's I really mean, no point ultimately forecasting I, beyond yeah, that. I have an opinion on everything. That doesn't mean I know. You know, I, I mean, it, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. But at the moment, it's quite good. And, and I would say what I do know is the trends as we look out in the next quarter or two or three, yeah. they're still very strong. Very strong, historically strong. So, so here's why I want to address the China issue with you, because uh, the last to open, and that is one of your most significant regions in terms of concentration, just under 500 hotels yeah. for you there. Uh, what are the indications coming in from the Chinese market at this point in time in terms of recovery? Yeah, we have 500 hotels open and another 500 hotels in a pipeline in China. So we have a, you know, a thousand hotels opener and pipeline. It's a very big business. China, uh, you know, has been interesting because early in COVID, China got through it most quickly and recovered quite quickly, uh, largely by, uh, by domestic travel within China. And then when we got into Delta and Omicron, shut down, had a zero COVID policy and really, um, really slowed down from a travel and tourism point of view. They're, they're past that. Um, they have now sort of joined the rest of the world. I think at this point, COVID is behind them. And they're opening up again like it was in early 2020 in the first you know wave of recovery in china it's mostly domestic mm -hmm. travel um and it and it's getting quite strong very very rapidly my expectation is as you get into the second half of this year but more particularly next year you're going to see a lot more chinese outbound business and a lot more international business arriving in china but that will take some time it takes you know infrastructure making sure they're Airlines, you know, get slots in and out, and those things are happening, you know, day by day. That's getting better, uh, but it'll take some time to for that maturation process to occur. But it's 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 coming back quickly. It's it's not quite back to 2019 levels yet, but getting awfully close. Well, let's talk about India. You are here, so let's let's, here. let's let's talk, talk about, about how exciting the Indian market looks to you at this point in time. You talked about uh, supply and demand. I mean, it's hard to find a hotel room in India today. It, We've also got the G20, uh, uh, you know, meetings underway here uh, for a whole year. For yeah. a whole year, yeah. and that that works well. I for... talked to the Minister of Tourism about it. It's a very <laughs> unique approach, which I love to have it in 50 different markets throughout the country. It's so, so how do you intend to? capitalize on the India opportunity? Yeah, we're relatively small in India. So we have open and pipeline about 40 hotels. Um, that's against a pipeline, a, a population of 1.4 billion people. So I would say, like you look at the United States, or, you know, we have over 5,000 hotels with a, with a much lesser population. But the ultimate opportunity in India is extraordinary. It's, ve it's, a, it's a market that has huge domestic travel, very big outbound market, uh, obviously in a in a post COVID world, um, a very big population, incredible growing middle class with uh, with significant desire to travel and very undersupplied from a hotel point of view. So against the 1.4 billion people, there's only 2.6 million rooms. I mean, using the U.S. As, which is the largest hotel market in the world, we have five. We have double the number of rooms with a fraction of the population. So as you look at the next, not just 10 years, but 10, 20, really the next 50 years in this market, I think there's unlimited potential for growth. So while we're relatively small, we're very committed to this market. We are, we've been here a long time. We will be here. We believe that we can have a very large business. It will, it will take some time. We believe um, that all the big international players that are here are at the tip of the iceberg. We're all, we're all relatively small relative to yeah. 
scale that we have, certainly at Hilton in other parts of the world, but the underlying fundamentals are extraordinary. There is no market in the world where the underlying fundamentals over the very long term are better. Well, if that is the case, and that's your hypothesis, that there's that no market indeed. like India at this point in time, uh, in terms of the underlying fundamentals, uh, what will be the priority areas? Is it going to be, as you said, you're small today, but you intend to focus much more on this market. Luxury, is that the end that you intend to focus well, on? Uh, premium economy uh, or the lower end of the market? Well, I'm going to give you a scoop. So luxury yes. for sure. We're going we're gonna to sign at lunch today a Waldorf Astoria in Jaipur, which... It's an extraordinary resort market, an unbelievable weddings market in India. Weddings are obviously a, a major industry all around the world, and particularly here in India. So we're really excited about getting Waldorf Astoria, the most iconic luxury brand in the world, in this market. We already have Conrad represented. And so we'll continue to grow in the luxury space. But the way we think about this market is the same way we think about every market. It's a network effect. So what we want to serve in India, and for that matter around the world, is we want to serve customers for any need they have anywhere they want to be. So that means we have to cover all price points. The biggest trend around the world, which is also true here in India, is the mid-market. Why? Because the bulk of the population that is going to travel ends up is in the middle class. And that's what those folks can afford. And so we very much like the luxury space and we'll continue to do that. We like the upper upscale space with our core Hilton brand, the most recognized brand on earth. But we also will very, be very focused on the mid-market. For us, that is already represented by Hilton Garden Inn, which is here in this, but many more Hilton Garden Inns, um, as well as Hampton by Hilton and potentially other brands in the mid-market. So when you wake up in India in 50 years, okay, what you'll have is a, you know, much like we do in, in most of the other major travel destinations in the world, you'll have a very large number of hotels and you'll have representation across all the different price points so that we can serve customers' needs for any travel. I, I don't know if, you, if I'm going to be around for the next 50 years or not. Sure you ask, will be. I might not. The by the way, I years. might not be. But <laughs> so the next five yeah. years, how many hotel rooms for the Hilton Group in I India? think opener and pipeline, 75. That's what, that's what our aim is. That's what my team here is very motivated to accomplish. And I think that's, and that's very feasible for us. Okay. Uh, you know, outside of India, and let's talk about the, the trends that you went tend to focus on. Uh, there's the leisure plus travel market that has become a thing. Bleisure. Uh, bleisure. I hate uh, that well, word, but we all I, are using it. I don't it. particularly like it either, yeah, but I'm not going to use hate. It's too strong. But vacations, staycations, I mean, we've gone through a whole bunch of things through the course of the pandemic. What are you seeing as emerging trends? How much of this is transient? How much of this is likely to be more permanent? Yeah. I think the biggest trend I see is, is again, just the continuation of a trend we've been seeing for a hundred years, and, and that is mobility. Okay, so why do people, you know, sort of blend business and leisure travel? Because they're more mobile, because they can, because they have a little bit more flexibility in terms of their work environment, and they got this thing in the, that they carry around in their pocket or their purse or whatever, where they can pretty much work from anywhere, so they're more mobile. They can get around, there's more airports, there's low-cost air carriers, rail, highways, you know, there's a lot more infrastructure and, uh, that, allow, that affords mobility. And so when you lift way up and you think about our business, you know, over a very long span of time, what has driven the, the most important underlying driver of uh, growth in our business has been increased mobility. People want to travel. We know that. That's the human condition. They want to interact. They want to travel. They want to see places. Uh, having the ability, having the infrastructure, having the technology uh, and the flexibility in their lives um, that allows them to take advantage of that mobility is a very powerful thing. So I think leisure, I think everything that you're seeing is a continuation of people having more mobility in their life, more flexibility mm -hmm. in their life. And I think that's a trend that's going to continue. And I think it's going to be a very, very positive trend for our growth over time. Uh, you know, you talked about mobility and, and the fact that you can pretty much now do anything across your mo mobile phone or laptop from anywhere in the world. Uh, and so I want to talk about technology and what you're doing with technology on the back end and also, more importantly, at the front end. Uh, and what the use of technology and digitization is going to mean eventually for a business like yours in, in the next five years. Does it 
help ECAP margins even further? Uh, what does it mean in terms of workforce, think, workflow? Listen, I think in the end, we are always going to be a, a people, a business of people serving people. So it's chat all, GPT is not is, going to replace it's not, people? No. I mean, what technology is going to do, I think of technology, you know, I sort of made up this phrase called fidgetal. It's the blending of the physical and the digital. I think, I don't know, somebody made it up and, and I took it or I made it up. But, and I, that's how we think about it is there's always a physical element to what, to what we do, whether that's the, the hard product or the people serving people, you know, the, the, you know, the service delivery of our people. And then there's a, a digital element to it, how they think about when they dream about a vacation, booking, a, you know, a, a, or a trip, booking a trip, you know, how they interact with us and do things during their stay, how we interact with, with travelers after the stay. And there's a bunch of things in that continuum of how we engage with a customer that can be digitized that makes it more efficient, but also make, takes friction out of it and, and affords more delight to the customer. And in the, in the process of doing it allows our people to focus more on the things that, that, that we can't digitize, that, that ultimately allow us to curate a better human experience. And so that's how we think about it, is blending the human and the digital in a way that creates um, unbelievable consistency, but also a, a world-class friendly experience for the customer. One of the things that we've seen through the course of the pandemic or a side effect of the pandemic for businesses, whether it's aviation or travel and hospitality, it's just not that aspirational for people to want to work in these industries, given what we saw happen through the course of the pandemic. Yeah. Is that a That's is that getting a, a lot big better. By the way, that's been a challenge for time and eternity. I've been in this industry a long time, 40 years or so. And that's been an, you know, an industry issue, which is people in many cases look at other industries as more aspirational whether that's you know technology or venture capital or things that you know that that uh, i always say like take suck all the oxygen out of the room and they don't think about our industry as having the diversity of uh, opportunity and the upward mobility that it does i mean i started my first job was basically plunging toilets at hotels i run one of the biggest companies on earth I'm a testament to the idea that you can have an upward mobility. And there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of stories of team members in our ecosystem, let alone all the other players in the industry that started out on, in frontline jobs that now run businesses, big, you know, every hotel's a big businesses and have grown and learned and, and uh, evolved and had tons of upward mobility. So it's the, one of the things we've been trying to do as an industry for many years is make sure people understand the opportunities, how the complexity of the business, the, the intellectual opportunity, the growth, the upward mobility, um, and, and the opportunities as an industry that's not just large, but one of the fastest growing industries, not during COVID, but broadly one of the fastest growing industries on earth. I mean, we're one in 10 jobs in the world, travel and tourism, one in five new jobs, 10% of global GDP, one of the top five pre-COVID um, growth industries in the world. And so there's all sorts of opportunity. We, we have been trying, and I think doing a pretty good job of getting that message out. COVID didn't help. OK, COVID, you know, scared everybody in a lot of ways, but it was particularly painful in travel and tourism. But we're to the other side of COVID. And the nice thing is, I think people are coming back in the industry and have a really good attitude about it. Part of that's driven in some parts of the world or some of the industries that were sucking all the oxygen out of the room are do not doing as well. And people are, you know, people are losing jobs at, at you know, at, at, uh, at mass tech companies, banking venture capital and the like. And so, you know, some of the blooms are off some of those roses in a way where people maybe are a bit open minded. And so we're not we're, we're seeing things normalize in terms of our ability to attract talent on a global. But every market's different. It's 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 in, we're in pretty good shape. Corporately, we really have no issues attracting talent. We're the number two great place to work in the world. So we have an unbelievable culture. Uh, and on the front line, it was difficult during COVID for sure and coming out of yeah. COVID, but we're getting there. We're not all the way back. Every market's different, but I'd say we're largely back to where we want to be.
you know, uh, not quite, but almost. You know, speaking of opportunities, and I want to talk to you about the kind of uh, product innovations, adjacencies that you are looking at. Some of your competitors are looking at things like yachts, etc. Yes. Uh, what what, what are you yeah. looking at? Well, listen, we we look at all of the adjacencies in, as a means to an end, and the and the and the end is that we want our customers to have what you know in the relationship with us to be engaged and concentrate their spend with us. Um, and we do that generally through Hilton Honors, through our loyalty program. And so we look at a lot of different things that we do that are not the core business to continue to further that engagement to get you know higher and higher uh, levels of loyalty and thus bigger share of wallet. And we've, I think, done a really good job. We've we had lots of partnerships with like Live Nation, with Amazon, you know, di different partnerships in different places around the world in a way that have kept our customers engaged. And I think uh, as a result of all of that, we have the highest level of occupancy represented by loyalty members of anybody in our business on a global basis. Every market may be a little bit different, but on a global basis, we lead the industry. And so what our customers are saying to us is, what you do in terms of the product, the service, the different brands that you have, as well as some of these partnerships and ways that you allow, you, you recognize our loyalty to your business um, are working and we're staying very, very engaged with you. We'll continue to look at other adjacencies. I sort of was brought up in the basic tenant, um, right or wrong, which served me pretty well, was like know the business you're in. And, and be really good at it and stick to it and try not to get distracted. And so a bunch of those adjacencies we haven't pursued because we view them as distractions and we've found other ways to, to have, um, to keep our, our customers engaged. And so far they're more engaged than most of our competitors customers are. So, uh, uh, you know, would M&A be a strategic distraction that you're willing to take on at this point in time? If history is any <laughs> indicator of the future, probably not. Uh, you know, I've been at the company six, almost 16 years. I used to be an M&A person. Um, and so I like M&A. I know how to do it. We've done none of it. Um, and so I don't think it's likely that, you know, and, that, and that's because we've had really good success in growing the company organically by not just adding brands or adding hotels with owners in different parts of the world to broaden our network effect, but adding brands. I mean, when I got to the company, we had nine brands. We have 21 brands. We have, we've launched every one of those organically. Why do I like that better? Because my own view is we can deliver more on exactly what the customer wants and it, from the standpoint of a modern approach. To, to meeting customers' demands because we custom design each of those brands at, at, at those incremental price points that we add exactly the way that we think they want it because we're you know, in a constant interaction um, with our customers. And so never, I say we'd be remiss in not saying on CNBC what I say everywhere I go, never say never, but I think it's unlikely. Um, I think our track record's really good. Nobody's, I think it's fair to say, nobody's developed more brands than we have done it well, and all our brands are very high performing, so our customers are saying they like the way we do it. So if M&A is off the table, what else is sparking interest, pun intended? <laughs> sparking interest? Well, spark is sparking interest. I don't, you know, we're in India. I don't see us bringing spark to India soon. There's never, Why not? Uh, I just don't think we're ready for it here at, at Hilton. The market at some point may be ready for it, but we're certainly launching it in the United States. My guess is it will be off to Europe in the not too distant future. I honestly believe, and I'm sure our competitors would have a counterpoint to this. We'll, we'll see, time will tell who's right. I think I'll be right, but <laughs> I think it's probably the most dis dis one of the simpler things we've done, but one of the most disruptive things we've, we've done because we're we're playing in a space which we haven't played in, that being economy or premium economy. But we're doing it in a way that really there is no brand that can offer the customer what we're going to offer, which is a very consistent level of product and service because by definition, if you go look at the biggest economy brands in the world, no matter where they are, it's a very high beta experience in terms of the physical product. We're gonna grow this brand very quickly. It's gonna get to scale and every single hotel to get through the gate has to do a, the base uh, renovation to touch every customer facing piece of this property. Um, and so when customers walk into a spark, 
it's going to be a spark. It's going to be clean, neat, refreshed in every, in every element of what they experience in that hotel. Nobody else can really do that. And so we believe that a customer, even at that price point, using the U.S. as a as sort of a, you know, the first market, you know, at a $70, $80 price point, customers deserve to be able to have a great stay, and we're going to give it to them. Kristen Setter, it's been an absolute pleasure. Many thanks for joining us here on CNBC TV 18 on the Global Dialogue. We look forward to having you back here in India. Sounds great. Great to be here. Thanks again for having Well, that's it then on this edition of the Global Dialogue. We'll see you again next week. Till then, from all of us here on the team, goodbye, and many thanks for watching.